was the argument that going back to why, they sh why there should be slavery. And then also this idea that all these great society programs, this government aid was going to fail, who didn't deserve it, who they got to cut to the front of the line where hardworking white people are now being mistreated and being prejudiced against. And it fits with this idea of state funds. And don't forget, these attitudes are very much like that attitude about Little Rock Central High going all the way back to Bacon's Rebellion. And so this is about integration, and that's in Alabama, race mixing is, a commun is communism. Uh, he's far too happy for that, that's a little spooky. And this is an anti bossing for integration in the 1970s. And so this movement, and there is an element to this day. So this is a powerful back and forth. And in Sweden, in 1967, they decided to have a day unannounced where everyone had to drive on the left side of the street and red light mean go and green light meant stop. And it led to that, that Stockholm. True story, they tried it as a sociological experiment and it just led to chaos. Nobody went to work, the entire city shut down, and that's it. And that is called, you want to try it? That's pretty good, but now you guys are like this. Like a German, you know, it's rich. Okay, so, <laughs> huh? yeah. so in 1968, the Tet Offensive, and this would be a big turning point in the Vietnam War. LBJ. That's the thing, just a fun fact? Yeah, just oh, okay, cool. Just a fun fact. <laughs> I think that was fun. So why did they do that? Sociological experiments. So what would happen? And, it, and what happened was exactly what anybody could have predicted. The whole city would shut down. So, 1968. Lyndon Johnson had been telling people there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I should add, the economy was booming. This was the strongest American economy in its history. And so he had been telling everybody the war is winning. I know there's a lot of cash and told 20,000 Americans that died by the beginning of 68. But Johnson was saying the end is near. And then it was blown up on the. <coughs> there we go. The Viet Cong planned a surprise attack on the Vietnamese Lunar New Year tech, that informal ceasefire. An attack on January 31st where they were going to attack every major city or base in Vietnam. And the plan was this surprise attack would trigger a popular uprising and the southern government would collapse. Back then, whole people were like, what happened in China in 49, where the South Vietnamese army would join the Viet Cong. And by the way, Ho Chi Minh was, he, you, know, the, you know who I'm talking about, Ho Chi Minh. He was nearing the end. He by then was quite ill. He only had less than a year, or a little bit over a year left to live. But that was the plan. And it did. They attacked all major cities and did cause quite a surprise. But in the end, it failed. No popular uprising. But it blew apart the entire American view of the war. How can we be winning, like LBJ said, and then they do this massive operation? And the army said, we're winning, we're winning, we won. But it seems like this didn't look like victory. That is on the streets of the capital, Saigon, where there's armored fighting, and they actually, for a couple days, turned Saigon into a free fire zone where they shot anybody on the streets. In the old imperial capital of Wei, Marines had to fight building by building to drive the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese out. And in the, in the U.S. Embassy, which was like a, like a fortress, South Viet, or Vietnamese, sorry, Viet Cong guerrillas blew their way in and held out for nearly a day until they were either killed or wounded and forced to surrender. These did not look like victory. And then, maybe the most famous scene in the Vietnam War, I've already showed you a couple really famous ones, where the police chief of South Vietnam summarily executes a su suspected Viet Cong guerrilla, and an AP photographer and an NBC news team, news team were there, and this picture was taken literally at the moment he fired. And it's on film too, it's horrific. It's absolutely unbelievable. But this kind of chaos, as a man who probably was a gorilla, but no way to know for sure, but, you know, they would dress up in clothes to try to disguise their way into the attack. This doesn't look like victory. This looks like chaos. This is like maybe LBJ was lying. And the impact of Tep would be long lasting to this day. On the ground, it was a tactical meeting on the battlefield. 
The South Vietnamese and U.S. victory. In fact, this is the best the South Vietnamese army ever fought in the war. But strategic, long term, a massive North Vietnamese victory. And Viet Cong victory. To unify, remember, to get one country. The Viet Cong were decimated, but this totally changed American public opinion. For some reason, I put down loses faith like we were doing it right at that moment. We're all losing faith. I should have lost faith. But the United States public lost faith in the war. Before the Tet Offensive, the majority of people still supported the war. It was unpopular, but it was like, we have to win the thing. We have to win the war. After this offensive, it totally reversed. 60-44 before the war, 60-40 against after the battle. And people wanted out. Even those who wanted to go to war say, well, we're never going to win this thing. Then just get out. And then people quit trusting the president. They called it the credibility gap. We mentioned that once before. Where they begin to look back and said, what up? He's probably lying about this. We didn't win. He lied about other things. Who knows? And more of the stuff that Johnson did lie about. So here's a good pin from that era. And I should add, when the Army said, we won, we won, we won, and then asked for 206,000 troops, if you won, why do you need more troops? This totally reversed the trend for war. Public opinion turned. This would be an epic changing moment, a huge change in American history with the Tet Offense. And, oh, I should add, this credibility gap would lead to a further a distrust in government that would begin to grow, but would begin to spiral out of control. And if you look at that bottom left-hand corner of your notes right at the conservative revival, this distrust in government would be a major part of the conservative revival. You can't trust the government. Therefore, you can't trust things like the New Deal and the Great Society. Hmm? Backwards, yeah. <coughs> and so, while this happened, we have one of the most important elections in American history. The election of 1968. LBJ is, you know, everyone just assumes he'll get renominated, of course, and be elected. He won the biggest popular vote venture in history. But Gene McCarthy, this is Gene McCarthy right here. He, he was a senator from Minnesota, jumped in as an anti-war candidate. In fact, McCarthy agreed with most of the great society, but he's against the war. Primaries didn't mean that much. This is the last election where the candidates were still chosen at the convention. But primaries were more like kind of a test to see where you're at. Today, primaries decide the candidates. But in New Hampshire, McCarthy nearly beat LBJ. LBJ won, but not by much. And this was a shock. Everybody assumed LBJ would wipe the floor in this primary. Everybody thought that. And this would be huge because in the wings, waiting, was Robert Kennedy. And Kennedy jumped in after that. And Kennedy, this was Johnson's greatest fear, that John Kennedy would jump in the race, and now he'd have to fight against the legacy of John Kennedy. And Kennedy started out against the war, then come, I mean, sorry, started out for the war, then became against the war. And he called it peace with honor. And even though Kennedy started with a bang, he actually split the anti-war vote with McCarthy. So there was going to be a convention fight. But LBJ still runs everything. But Kennedy had this magnetism that actually he never showed until after his brother died, after his brother was killed. And he appealed to all races, to men and women. He really looked like he could have been a candidate that would have been really powerful. My guess is he would have won if he would have got the Democratic nomination. And this is a great picture. He's on the back of a car, and people are climbing on the car just trying to shake his hand. Isn't that a cool picture, though? I just think that is great. And here he is giving a speech, and there were no social, uh, secret service guards for pres presidential candidates. So we had kind of informal guards, including Rosie Greer, who was a starting defensive tackle for the Rams. <laughs> now, he probably doesn't know a lot about protecting a presidential candidate. By the way, this is what we call a foreshadowing. And so, with that though, Lyndon Johnson, after Tet, after the riots, after all that he thought he had achieved and didn't really look like it was all going to happen, with Vietnam especially, he shot everybody and dropped out. This is a screenshot of him announcing it on national TV. And originally it was going to be a talk about the war in Vietnam, but he actually talked about setting up peace conferences. By the way, where do you have peace conferences? What city? Paris. Paris. 
They actually start talking about this. This changed everything. Then he finished the speech with, I will not run because I need to spend all my time working for peace. Unbelievable. Johnson was a political giant. No president has ever achieved more. Good and bad, I know. But achieved more than Lyndon Johnson. And the war broke him. I will spend a day after the test and I'll tell you LBJ stories. And you will not believe LBJ. You just simply will not believe what kind of guy it was. And why people like him so much is really odd. But a week after that announcement, Martin Luther King was in Memphis, Tennessee. He was supporting a garbage worker strike. He had plans for a huge poor person's march on Washington, D.C. to demand more rights for working people. The black power movement and black nationalism had been kind of leaving him aside. But he still was a powerful voice, and he went there to support garbage workers who were on strike. There he is in a protest. These are the strikers. Now, when they show civil rights, uh, uh, civil rights movement, they'll a lot of times show like generic protesters, and they'll show these men striking because they're demanding to be treated like men, treated like humans, because they were so poorly treated. The way they treated garbage workers it was unbelievable. Hard job, anyway. Really hard job. <laughs> but that's what they wore. That I'm a man. <laughs> And they're talking not about voting rights, they're talking about economic rights, which is difficult. By the way, I thought this was a good picture the National Guard was called out because of the strike. King actually gave his last speech in front of many of the strikers on April 3rd, maybe his greatest speech, but he also seemed to predict, he like knew what was gonna happen. Since 1955, when he was, head of, well, was a spokesperson for the bus boycott, he's had a target on his head. He knew it. They're trying to kill him. There have been attempts to kill him. He's been arrested with virtually no cause. The FBI in 1965, uh, they've been bugging and wiretapping and harassing him for years. And they caught him having extramarital affairs. And they said, we're going to let this and other information out unless he commits suicide. So they tried to get him to kill himself. So this is the kind of life he had been leading. I mean, he always knew at any moment it could end. April 4th, 1968, on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel, which is now the National Civil Rights Museum. It's a hotel that, was, even though there was a Civil Rights Act, this was still the only hotel where blacks could go in downtown Memphis. He would be assassinated, and there were police all over, but the police weren't there to protect him. The police were there just hoping he would do something so they could arrest him. And so this very famous picture, with King lying, dying here, shot through the neck. And like Andrew Young, uh, Jesse Jackson is advised right there. You know, they're pointing to the police because the police are coming at them with guns drawn, ready to arrest them. And they're saying, no, the assassin was across the street. They're pointing to this boarding house where the assassin was. And he would die soon after. They would go through a manhunt for this, but you see it right here, bloody writing. All over the United States, especially in areas where it's a very segregated country. Protests, mostly um, African Americans hit the streets, just an anger, distress, just totally distraught by what happened. And furious that this could happen. Like the idea we're never going to get rights. Here is, that's in Detroit. Uh, that's in um, Raleigh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And here's Stokely Carmichael, Carmichael telling Black Bear, get your guns, it's going to kill all of us. It convinced was whites are going to get us all. In fact, the first gun control laws of the 1960s were to get guns out of the hands of the Black Panther Party, signed by Ronald Reagan, who's then governor of California. So this was an amazing time. And this would also contribute to a massive conservative backlash. Some of the interviews that people did at this time were shocking, saying that he deserved to die. He caught it, he brought it on himself. Mostly white. Men saying it, but whites saying it. And this is something I put this poll up here to give you an idea about Martin Luther King. Today, virtually everybody will say, oh yeah, we have high favorable opinions of Martin Luther King. 94%, that's 2011. I bet it's like 96% now. And he's like, you just have to say it. It's just what you have to say. But look what it was in 66. <coughs> and it was even lower in 68. And that means the vast majority of whites have an unfavorable attitude towards Martin Luther King. They're asking too much, they're demanding too much, too much change. And that was this conservative backlash.
James Earl Ray would be caught. He actually made it to London and tried to go to Africa to fight as a mercenary. He was the assassin. He was captured, and for some reason, assassins always seem to have three names. I should add one more thing. King's family to this day believes that the FBI did it. And considering what the FBI did to King, I can certainly understand that. I should add, that was the leadership of the FBI, man named Jay Hoover. LBJ didn't do it, but LBJ did listen to some of the buggings because he's LBJ. But James Earl Ray, he would admit it, then recant. He would die in prison. And then just two months later, after winning the California primary, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. In fact, this is a screenshot of the TV where he just got done at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles saying we won, and now off to Chicago for the convention. He gave the victory sign as he walked through the hallways and walked through the kitchen to get off the back door. He was assassinated, and there is a bus by holding his dying body. The assassin, Sirhan Sirhan. I guess if you don't have three names, you have the same name. <laughs> but Sirhan Sirhan. Many witnesses, he was a Palestinian immigrant who appeared to be upset with Kennedy's support of Egypt. I'm sorry, what? Egypt, Israel. And still in prison today. He was he got the death penalty, but then when the Supreme Court ruled the death penalty was unconstitutional because it was so unfairly administered back in 72, all people on death row went to life in prison. So he's life in prison. Same thing what happened to Charles Manson, who died in prison. But Saran Saran. But you combine this with King's assassination, but also looking back to John Kennedy's assassination. And this really did look like there had to be something more sinister. And this would also increase the distrust in government. There's something sinister, some cabal, which would all help conservatives. And here are some shots taken from the train. And I put this down because these assassination bomb Kennedy and other agents of 68 really felt like there were so many lost opportunities, and then it doesn't matter. Lost opportunities to believe that Kennedy or King could have made a better world, and it didn't seem to happen in all ways. Well, the train I took Kennedy's body back. The train went from L.A. to Washington, D.C., where he lays next to his brother at Arlington. And totally spontaneous. People all the way, there are hundreds of these pictures, Kennedy's uh, official photographers on the train riding back and took these pictures from the train as it went by. People just came out to show their respect. Just just came out because they wanted to you know, show their grief and how uh, you combine this with King's assassination. So this family lined up at attention or saluting. It always makes me sad. Because lost opportunities, but into that void, it's the new, new, new Nixon. Nixon is back. People thought his career was over, but he would take advantage of this disunity and become the Republican nominee for president, Richard Nixon. And part of his appeal, he said, I'll win in Vietnam. I have a secret plan to get out of Vietnam with victory. He would say peace with honor too. His secret plan, as we would find out later, was to never leave. But People just so wanted out of the war. Yeah, it's true. He wanted to stay basically and more, use air power to hold on. But what he really appealed to, and this was so, it was clever politically, but so disunified the country to this day. He took on all those edges and said, I'm appealing to Americans who are being ignored. He called them the forgotten Americans. He would, in 1970, call them the silent majority. And it was hardworking, average, everyday white Americans. They wouldn't say that, at least in public, but everyone knew what he meant. People who work hard, play by the rules. It's their sons or themselves who are the ones being drafted or volunteering to go fight. They're not out there protesting. They're not like those rich, spoiled college kids who are out there, they got all the money, and they're out there protesting, and nothing ever happened to them, but we do the job. He appealed to them, and it was shockingly effective. Most working people and union members, because unions were really strong then, voted Democratic, and this would chip away. This really chipped away. 
where you have a lot of union members voting again for, for candidates who were anti-union. And this would come back to bite them. But once again, Nixon formally called it the Southern Strategy, and they said law and order, we're gonna crack down on the crime. Everybody kind of knew what that meant. Also, peace with honor, it took Kennedy's term. But race, race underlined everything. Racial issues, divide by race. Kevin Phillips was one of his key advisors, and I put them in there just so you could see what the Southern strategy was. Phillips laid out this in Southern strategy, and then the year after uh, news, we did an article about it. So talk about Nixon Southern strategy. This is 1969. There's Kevin Phillips, and this is a quote from Phillips. Can you see it? Digital fold means scared of black people. So get whites scared of blacks or become Republicans. And that was the strategy. It's called the Southern strategy. Yeah, Phillips actually would come back later and he kind of tried to repent from this. He was just thinking coldly, how do we win elections? By the way, he said all these states then, that'll be a 50 year Republican majority. Here we are. Because of this issue. And then we get the rest of the South. And that is the Republican, that's the uh, um, the base of the Republican support, is what he was talking about in 1969. So that's a pretty big issue right here. And Phillips is an interesting guy. But they also want to emphasize these social issues, soon to be called the culture war. And these social issues, and now Abbott, the idea being that liberals, because you have liberals from FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, liberals have allowed this to happen. How? They're too permissive, and now we have sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Now we have all these protests and crime. The women's rights movement was just taking off, and women demanding equal rights. And they really hit on this values. And all this summed up and really personified this conservative revival. But a key piece they kept coming back to, and is the essence of kind of this reaction, this goes back to um, years of uh, all the way back to the French Revolution, but people need to know their place. Life was a lot easier when people knew their place, when they knew their place. Women should know their place. And what's their place? At home, married with children, and that's it. <laughs> Blacks were perfectly happy till a bunch of agitators got them to try to demand equal rights. Teenagers were perfectly happy and always all of their parents until they got these loose values and morals. Now, of course, we should be clear about it. Life isn't like that, but that is the attitude. And this was used all the time. Here are students sitting in at Columbia, going to sit in and protest uh, discrimination on the Columbia U University of Columbia campus. This is Woodstock the next year. Uh, right there, you can see me. And, oh, I'm sorry, grandma. Hmm? My grandma was. Really? Uh, former teacher. It's Plano, so it's up to stop. It's Plano, it's up to stop. So, this is still, this cultural divide that starts here is still in many ways, you can see this as a political divide today. This is, we still live in Nixon land. And the Democrats, total disarray. The Democratic Convention in Chicago was a disaster. The Democrats were split between Hawks. What do Hawks want? Stay in the war. Doves against the war. Did you say food? Hawks, bro. <laughs> Hawks were for the war. Doves were against the war. Johnson's for the war. And even though he's not running for president, he controls the convention. And there were protests. They thought there'd be 100,000 protesters against Johnson's war. There were less than 10,000. Actually, there were more police and National Guardsmen than protesters. This is not a good look for the Democratic Party, by the way, is it? Welcome, Democrats, with soldiers with bayonets. Well, the la during, while they're doing the Democratic platform, maybe that would stop the war plan? Yeah. Like uh, didn't Kennedy's and King's assassination show LBJ back in well, he's still obviously in the line yeah. he, he Once he got out, he knew he could not get back. Okay. And 
It's at the Hilton Hotel, Hotel in Chicago. They have a big convention center. And so in the upper floors of it, this shows while they were doing the Democratic or trying to figure out the Democratic platform, the protesters hit the streets, even though they were told not to. There's only less than 10,000 of them. And thousands of police met them. And these protests were met by police who took off their badges and then waded into the crowd with their nightsticks, as you see here, but really see here, and beat the hell out of the protesters. In fact, they would call this later, a congressional investigation would call it a police riot. Why'd they take their badges off? Exactly, that's why identification records. So they wouldn't be identified. And think about what I just told you about those hardworking people that looked at it as my kids were out there fighting and you were rich, spoiled kids protesting. And that divide is just ripping apart. And this is a this is actually a reporter got beat up by the police talking to another guy got beat up by the police. And this does not this made the Democrats look in total disarray. Hubert Humphrey, the vice president, would get the nomination, but he's going to be torn. The Democrats are torn apart by a group that wants to end the war. And Humphrey, who actually he actually hated the war, but had to support him because he was a vice president, the Johnson. So he got the nomination. So what what happened? They were, they were when they split between remember what I told you? The convention was or the, the convention still decided the nominee. The primary was primary more like a beauty contest. Now the primary is decided. Back then it was still the convention. So, so, that, so what was the thing that got him Johnson still controlled the Democratic Party, so he made sure he got the votes. Now if Kennedy would not have been shot, he might have got the and but Humphrey nearly won too. So Humphrey got the nomination, and nobody thought he would win. He's gonna be surrounded by protesters chanting, Dump the hump, dump the hump, dump the hump, which is so fun to say for kids. But everybody thought he would lose because he was stuck with the war. And then a third party candidate jumped in. The segregationist Democratic governor of Alabama, we mentioned it before. George Wallace. And his running mate was a chief of staff of the Air Force, Curtis LeMay. He actually was a liberal Democrat, but it's kind of in his reputation. And they're split again, just like 48. And they want state rights, anti civil rights. They also were going to crack down on the shades. That's what he called the long haired hippies and the anti war movement and blacks. <coughs> they also said, we'll use nuclear weapons if we have to win this war. We'll blow them away. And there's no hiding what he's doing here. That's him in the campaign. That's actually in San Francisco. But he has the Confederate battle flag, and everybody knows what that meant. Anti-equal rights. One, one race on top. So, Nixon assumed he would win until a month before the election, Humphrey came out against the war. But it was too late. It wasn't enough. It came out too late. Labor unions, as I, as I told you that split before about working people, so many were thinking, we're the one fighting this war, the hell with them, we're going with Nixon. And so, it was too late, and then everything changed. Everything changed. Johnson announced we might have a peace agreement. A Paris peace agreement. And soon it called the October Surprise, it's October after the November election, we might have an agreement. And, what does that mean? Humphrey might win. If Humphrey would be the Democratic nominee if it win that election. This is huge. There's Johnson talking about it. Nixon fears. You can imagine Nixon thinking, oh no, I might lose. So in a very secret operation, we know for a fact happened because the FBI was illegally bugging them. I know. Richard Nixon conspired with the president of South Vietnam, President Tu. That's name is Tu. And they scuttled the peace talks. South Vietnam walked out of the peace agreement. That's two. And there wouldn't be peace. At least the U.S. could not pull out till 1970. Fully end the war till 1973. Here's the thing about that. The basic agreements on this peace conference in, 19, in 1968, they're almost identical to the ones they had in January 73 when the U.S. pulled out. In that time period, over a million American, or sorry, a million Vietnamese would die, and over 20,000 Americans would die. And over 100,000 would be badly wounded and mutilated because of this war. Nixon was willing to kill 
millions, hundreds of thousands to win the war, to win the election. And that is why he will be the only president, I will tell you, that I personally despise. <coughs> That tells you everything you need to know about what type of person Richard Nixon is and about everything about his politics. And yes, that was part of the ironic joke that they give you that poster, which I keep up. So, Nixon would win in a razor thin victory. And everyone thought he'd blow him out. Less than 1% in the popular vote. I know that Toro College is 100, 110 votes apart, but a few states differed, especially Illinois and Wisconsin, and Humphrey would have won. It was that close. So, Nixon came in as the great unifier. Huh? What? I don't know what he's doing. I think he's about ready to do his this, but he's like just starting to open his fingers up to do it, and that's when they caught the picture. So Nixon did out, even though Nixon would be the most divisive president since Andrew Johnson. Remember Andrew Johnson, the Nixon, Nixon, Reagan's vice president who I say Reagan, Lincoln's <laughs> vice president, who would uh, be the first president to impeach. Remember, the impeachment doesn't mean removal from office. Would be the only other president to be impeached. Lincoln, Clinton. Yeah. And Nixon did have one big advantage: Apollo Eleven, the first human to ever walk on a sound stage and act like he landed on the moon. It happened in 1969, and therefore Nixon got all the credit. Who was the first human to walk on the moon? Who? Neil Armstrong. Then they just had a movie about Neil Armstrong, First Man or something. That's Buzz Aldrin right there, the second, second person. So Nixon had very little to do with it, but since he's president, he could bask in the glory of this. But while this is going on, the women's rights movement, like the third stage of this, we have Seneca Falls and then Alice Paul in the 19th Amendment, and now the Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan one of the most important books in American history. She wrote this in the late 1950s. This is her in the early 1970s. And it's not a very good book. But in it, she writes about her experience as a college graduate and then what do you do when you're a woman? She was a successful woman. She got married, had children, quit working, and kept a clean house. And what she said was, and she was like, okay, that's what women are supposed to be. I'm supposed to be happy. And I hear, I'm not happy. And she talked to friends as she wrote a magazine article about the other women she graduated from college with, and they weren't happy either. And that's the mystique that women only need one thing in life to be happy to become a domestic housekeeper. And there's nothing wrong if that's the role they want. But her point is women need more than one avenue of success, just like men. In fact, men would see that as a trap where women are expected to only do that. Or if you want to go out of a career, you're a failure. There's something weird about you. You're a woman who does that. And this would up trigger modern feminists. And she would upgrade the National Organization of Women. And their key goals were kind of the troika. Education, employment, and equal rights. And equal rights amendment or the ERA. Everyone got that? Education, employment, and the ERA. And it took a few years. But by 68, the women's rights movement began to grow. They would be attacked for all sorts of things. But one of their big achievements would be Title IX. And Title IX would end discrimination in education. And this law, in fact, there's few laws to have a greater, a greater success and really showed a big difference. Women were routinely denied any access to any upper level classes. Women, if they went to college, not the only diploma women really should get was home economics, right? Because you got to capture a husband, right? In fact, that's what college was for, for women. You go to college to get married. Find a husband, right? And, but this would change everything. You look at honors classes and upper level classes today, and there are more uh, girls in high school, than that, young women in high school than boys, certainly here at Capitol. And you go to college, and now there's more women in college than men. And so this has had great effect. Yes, women are still paid significantly less for a lot of reasons. Also for college athletics, high school athletics for women, they did not exist before this. I went to the very first girls basketball game at Custer County High School, that's the high school in Mile City, 1973, and it was half court, jump ball after every made basket. It could have been the slowest game ever, but obviously things would change dramatically. And birth control. 
birth control had a huge effect. In fact, there's no single issue more important than birth control on the pill. Margaret Sanger, we mentioned her once before, would start Planned Parenthood, and she would spend her entire life to find effective birth control. It would be through her work that the birth control pill would come, something called the pill. Here's a showing the pill with the Greek symbol for women. The Griswold decision allowed that to be open, but there's nothing that's more important for equal rights for women. Economically, women could now, or it's more difficult to deny women jobs because, well, they're going to get pregnant someday. They're going to have children, so they don't. Where are you out of? The bell rang. The bell rang. There's no bells. There's bells now. And so, let me finish this real quick with the pill. Why are people out? This is a scam. Let me finish this real quick. But the big issue is women were routinely fired if they were pregnant or anything. I didn't get I didn't get to the last thing I wanted, but make sure you know what Roe versus Wade. You punks. I will review at lunch tomorrow or today, tomorrow, but tomorrow night. Six o'clock. Who's bringing pizza? You hungry? Like hawks, I'm always hungry. Oh no, the price is coming for me. Oh really? Yes. So are you going to be gone tomorrow? No. But you've been gone? Okay. No, Ben.